Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second press conference today on water signatures on the margin service surface. <laughs> and taking part in this media briefing, we have Svetlana Kostic, who is a professor in Computational Science Research Center in San Diego State University in the US. Chaling de Haas, who is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Geosciences at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And also in the same faculty, uh, Walter Mara, who is a researcher there. Uh, and uh, speakers will give short presentations and then we'll open the floor for questions. And remember that any press releases, documents uh, related to the press conferences are available at media.egu.eu slash documents. I'll now hand over to Svetlana. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for coming out. Uh, as you know, the evidence for the Martian Ocean is uh, uh, steadily mounting. And my team is able to put forward a, a new piece of uh, convincing evidence. So I'm very excited to be able to share that evidence with you. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Professor Svetlana Kostic with Computational Science Research Center at San Diego State University. And I'm also with the uh, Union University. And I would like to acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, Dr. Jacob Kowalt with the Chevron Energy Technology and Dr. Isaac Smith with the Southwest Research Institute. Now, the focus objective of our research was to determine whether a certain bed forms that are called cyclic steps are present on the surface of Mars and in particular in the Vestitas Borealis Basin that potentially hosted uh, an ocean. And so we started our search by looking for uh, remnants of cyclic steps on fan deltas that are spread uh, along the proposed shoreline of, uh, of the ocean. And we did find them. We found them on uh, several deltas. But we feel particularly strongly about one piece of evidence that I will be sharing today with you. Those are actually remnants of cyclic steps on uh, Eolis uh, Mensa Delta. Now, the question that you may ask is why we decided to look for cyclic steps. And um, the reason is that cyclic steps are quite common bed forms on the ocean floor on Earth. And they have very important, um, very important role in the evolution of uh, deep sea uh, systems. Uh, so we hypothesized that if early Mars had an ocean, that these bed forms would have formed uh, on its uh, floor as well. Now, uh, the um, uh, necessary condition for formation of cyclic steps uh, on Earth is presence of so-called slope break. Okay. What, that means, oops, what that means is that you have a transition from very steep onto relatively mild slope, and that forms a kind of a break. Now, if you look at the typical structure of a deltaic deposit, you always see something that is called delta phase or force deposit. And then it usually transit into relatively mildly sloping bottoms of deposit. And that is that break that we are looking for. Uh, we call it here forced bottoms of transition or break. And that is what we expect would form cyclic steps on uh, Marsha deltas as well. Okay. And we have seen evidence of similar features on deltas on Earth. So that's why we were after them on Mars as well. Now, let me share with you just a, a little bit of earlier evidence, or rather summarize. Earlier evidence for the uh, water on Mars or ocean on Mars included interpretation of ancient shorelines. Also, uh, 17 of fan delta uh, deposits that have been uh, identified along the uh, proposed shoreline. And that is kind of research, so this is this uh, second line. So this is research that we are building on. And then also boulder rocks uh, containing with the, within the, or rather on northern plains of Mars. Now, as you know, the most recent piece of evidence comes from scientists at NASA. And they have uh, analyzed the water vapor in the atmosphere lingering today. And based on what is lost in space, they estimated that uh, Mars uh, had an ocean some four billion, year, billion years ago. And uh, it kind of... Uh, was over 20% of Martian surface. Now, um, let me kind of uh, show you what we are looking for. Probably most of you have never heard about cyclic steps, and that's why I have uh, this uh, uh, picture showing that cyclic steps are kind of train of steps that march upstream, okay? And there you can think of that as a, some kind of a repeating bed forms. And the flow over these bed forms is also very atypical. 
it has some kind of shock or discontinuity at upstream, at downstream end of each, each of, of these steps, okay? And so these discontinuities are called hydraulic jumps. And that is what uh, stabilizes each step within train and helps preserve the train as a whole, which really we need, we need that preservation potential. Since, as you know, geologic activity on Mars has raised a lot of very useful, potentially useful evidence. Now, as a side note, uh, just uh, nine years ago, we did not have a clue that cyclic steps even existed on the ocean floor of, of Earth. And that's why I'm very excited that we are able to uh, use uh, what we have learned on Earth to uh, kind of support uh, Martian ocean uh, hypothesis. Now, um, other question is, so as I said, we are trying to use analogy between bed forms on Earth with bed forms on Mars, and we are assuming since they exist on Earth, they will exist on Mars as well. The question is, could cyclic steps really form on Mars? And the short answer is yes, that they have already observed so-called Aeolian cyclic steps on both north and south polar layer deposits, okay? Well, in terms of uh, a mechanism that forms them, they are not quite the same as cyclic steps that we are after, okay? These are formed by uh, katabatic wind, so they are associated uh, with atmospheric processes, as opposed to our cyclic steps, cyclic steps that we are after, that are formed by water, okay? Now, in this particular case, uh, you have uh, katabatic winds blowing over ice. In our case, you will have water uh, running over erodible sediment, okay? So that is the difference. However, if you look at the, and see also know that these are kind of a, a 2D phenomenon as opposed to kind of linear phenomenon that our cyclic steps are. But if you look at the uh, plan, uh, uh, the side view, then you see easily that there is that infamous train of steps moving, uh, moving uh, uh, upward or uh, uh, in the counter direction of the flow. Now this is my last slide, and I just wanted to share with you what we have used. First of all, we read all available literature on bed forms. There, there is not too much, but we did uh, go over it. And then we used available, uh, uh, publicly available NASA data products, uh, mainly topography. Uh, and uh, here I'm okay showing what we have used that's collected by MOLA, that is Mars Orbiter Laser Artimeter. And then uh, uh, together with high resolution imagery, okay, of all kind. And we did find remnants of cyclic steps on several deltas, okay. However, what I want to share with you is in this red box, okay, this is actually this first line, where I'm showing uh, cyclic steps on Aeolis Mensai Delta. First of all, on this left image, what you see is kind of a, a top view of the delta. And you can recognize here that there is that uh, uh, forced deposit or delta phase. And then over here you see forced bottom set break. Right downstream of that forced bottom set break you see a channel, okay? Now, if we go back and we, if we are kind of zoom, we are zooming in, you see uh, this, the same channel and a number of cyclic steps within that channel moving uh, uh, upstream. Now, I also am showing here a cyclic step within channel on Earth, just uh, for the sake of comparison, and you can see that there is a lot of similarity. So what we like about this piece of evidence is that we found cyclic steps exactly where we expected them, based on physics, and then also that there is a lot of uh, similarity what has be, with what has been ob observed on Earth, and also that they are not net depositional, but rather net erosional, which is kind of different from what you would expect from aeolian, uh, aeolian bed forms. Now, for some other people with uh, some people with good eyes, you will see a lot of those uh, transverse ridges that are usually uh, signatures of cyclic step on, on Earth, cyclic steps on Earth, uh, uh, outside of the channel. And that potentially can tell you that this uh, channel actually uh, evolved, uh, was changing, switching position, that's uh, called the deltaic switching, okay? So with that said, we think that presence of cyclic steps on uh, Aeolian, uh, on uh, uh, Martian Delta actually are favoring the existence of an ancient ocean that is uh, very similar or analogous to oceans on Earth. Thank you so much.
Okay, so I'll talk about uh, sedimentological evidence for uh, debris flow formation of Martian gullies. And sedimentological evidence is a new method that has not been applied to Mars yet. So basically, just to explain what a gully is, here you can nicely see a, a gully. Can everybody see this screen or? Maybe I can point. use the pointer. So what you see here, this part is a source area. So here we are at the crater wall. And material is transported from here, down the crater wall, and then deposits somewhere here in this fan-shaped gully fan, they call it. Well, the question is, of course, how did they form? Because it's really important for the recent climate of Mars. And these landforms, in general, they are pretty young, especially in terms of Mars. So they can be less than one million years in age. So really, if you want to know something about the aqueous conditions in them, very recent climate, you should study these uh, landforms. So basically, of course, the main question is, were they formed by liquid water? There have been many hypotheses. For example, we can have fluvial flows. They require quite a lot of liquid water. We can have debris flows, which require a little bit of liquid water. And otherwise, we can have dry flows that require not a single amount of uh, liquid water. So in this presentation, I will explain you uh, afterwards. I will show that this new analysis of sediment sedimentology uh, implies that they form by debris flows. This would imply uh, that there was quite some presence of uh, liquid water in these gullies in the last few millions of years. But a debris flow typically contains 20 to 60 percent of water. So there was liquid water, but it was relatively restricted. So just to show you what a debris flow actually looks like, this is a very nice example of a debris flow. So you have this part, which is the frontal lobe, they call it. You see that it course, the coarsest grains are located here. And really, the, it has a marked uh, topography. So between here, the top, and here, maybe there's one, two, sometimes three meter in elevation difference over a very short range. So this is typically how you can recognize a debris flow. One thing that's one other thing which is really important is that they can, can transport these very large boulders. And they can do so because the amount of water is relatively restricted. So the density difference between a single boulder and the entire flow is rel relatively small. So they can actually float on top, on top of this debris flow. So this is just uh, to show you the, uh, a typical example of a Martian gully. In general, people started looking at the surface and wanted to identify such low bay deposits and see whether they were formed by debris flows. But this is really difficult on Mars because they can have been active for millions of years ago or maybe hundreds, thousands of years ago. But afterwards, nothing happened. But there is a lot of wind on Mars. There's weathering on Mars. So the surface is modified over time. So for example, this fan, it doesn't show any low bay deposits. But what you can see if you look carefully is that here at the crater bottom, you see a lot of dunes. <coughs> Some of these dunes, for example, this one, have migrated on top of the uh, gully fan surface. And here, even higher up, the original morphology, the original landforms, have been reshaped into dune-like deposits also. So we cannot really use the surface anymore to identify the processes. So we have to find something different. Well, just to show you an example of a terrestrial fan, this is the... Uh, this is Panamint Valley, it's valley next to Death Valley in the United States. What we see here is that here on top we have a source area. And we're standing now on the fan surface, on the alluvial fan surface. There's a very large dune complex which has migrated on top of this fan. And for the rest, as you can see here, you have a, a sand sheet on top of the surface. So the surface doesn't reveal anything anymore about the process. But if you look inside in this section, for example, you see a very diff different uh, story. You see a lot of large boulders and cobbles. So something else must have happened. So what I basically did is use the subsurface as the key to the surface. This is a, just a nice example to show you the difference between, for example, debris flows and fluvial flows in these sections. This is a typical example of a debris flow section in an alluvial fan in the Atacama Desert in Chile. So the surface has also been modified here. But if you look inside, you see that you have very large boulders. So this is me, I'm two meters, so this one is pretty big. And they're floating more or less in finer materials, which is generally clay, some sands, maybe a little bit of gravel. Also, you don't see any sorting. It's just one massive piece of sediments with no sorting or orientation or whatever. For comparison, 
This is very close by in the Atacama, but this is a fan alluvial fan formed by fluvial processes, so with much more water. Here you see some different sorting. For example, here you see a nice layer. Here, yeah, it's difficult to see, but you see some um, a small channel. And what is very important for the margin analysis is that you have no large boulders. Because fluvial flows, they cannot transport very large boulders over such slopes. Then, of course, back to Mars. Of course, it's very difficult to go there and to look inside a section, but we have, luckily, the high-rise satellite. It takes amazing images of 25 centimeters resolution. So if we have meter-sized boulders, we would be able to see them. This is a, a crater, which, again, one of these gullies. So here you see the gullies. And you can already see that there's a few channels. So if we zoom in onto this one, this is what we see. So here we have the higher slopes, here we have lower slopes, and here we have an incised channel. And we can look inside there and enhance the contrast. So here you see the surface and the section, and below you see the section with the best contrast for the uh, boulders there. So if you look at the surface, you don't see any of these lobate typical deposits for debris flows because it has been modified. If you look inside and you look here, you see that it's full of large boulders. They seem to float in this finer material. There's not really any sorting in distinct layers. This is typical evidence for debris flow formation. So I did this on a lot of uh, these systems and I found it very consistently over the entire mid-latitude where we find these gullies, that often we don't see anything at the surface, but if we look inside, which is a new method, we see typical examples of debris flow sedimentology, which would mean that liquid water was indeed involved in their formation. So to wrap up, a new analysis shows that these things have been formed by debris flows. Liquid water was thus, thus involved in the last millions of years on Mars, but because it's a debris flow, it is a restricted amount of water, but still is liquid water. And also, the debris flows on Earth, they're generally very episodic, so you can have tens of years with nothing, and at some point you have a lot of melting, maybe on Mars not, not typically rainfall, but melting of snow, and you can have a debris flow, and then a long period you have nothing, and then you can have a debris flow again. Thanks. Okay, hi. So, uh, my name is Wouter Marra from Utrecht University. I'd like to open my uh, presentation for you. Um, I can start with a note I already mentioned before. It's on the, on the website media.egu.eu slash documents. Um, I've up uploaded this presentation and several other documents and, and well background papers as well. So. Uh, have a look there. Um, so um, I, I've just finished my uh, my PhD uh, thesis. Um, uh, if you want to have uh, a digital copy, uh, uh, let me know. I'm happy to uh, to send you one. And I'm going to show you some of the nicest uh, things that uh, that came out of my research. So first of all, to to set the stage, uh, well, what's uh, 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 on Mars? Um, it, it it was there. Uh, there's a lot of evidence uh, about that. Um, but where I want to focus on is the question: Where did it uh, came from? So on the left here is an image of of really old terrains on Mars, like four billion years ago. Um, uh, such landscape uh, shows that there was was rain on this surface, and this is also the period when we uh, when, the, when there probably was was an ocean, uh, etc. But if you look at uh, younger um, uh, surfaces on Mars, uh, they have a much uh, a stranger uh, a surface, uh, much stranger surface features, uh, like the one showed over here. This is a typical um, uh, a channel we call, uh, call an outflow channel. Uh, uh, here's this uh, huge um, uh, ri river system, um, and there's, there's a lot of these things, th these things which are uh, tens of kilometers of, of, of width. Uh, and hundreds of meters uh, deep. And what's interesting is these are these source areas. There's these these, these pits uh, at, at the source with with with, with uh, correct features, uh, which led to the idea that these things were formed by by, by groundwater. Um, oh, I have some uh, annotation there. So just to uh, give you a bit of, of an overview, these uh, the, uh, evidence for for rain on Mars is, is really limited to a very early. Uh, uh, as systems four billion years ago, uh, and where I want to focus on and, and now is uh, this period that uh, came afterwards, uh, called the uh, Hesperian periods. And there's evidence for these strange outflow channels, 
uh, and I want to know how these uh, things were formed. So, uh, so the, the idea is that is, the, the things were formed by groundwater. Uh, there's a big uh, problem with groundwater is that it, it flows very slowly, while these uh, channels are, are, are extremely uh, large in, uh, in, in size. Uh, I can't really explain these, uh, the, 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 these volumes of water by just, by just groundwater. And we don't really know how these things work because they don't occur on Earth on, on such uh, large scales. So in order to investigate it, uh, this, I, investigate, uh, I conducted uh, landscape evolution experiments so on a small scale. I could mimic these uh, uh, conditions. Um, and on the bottom right here is the experimental setup, setup I used at the uh, Total Environmental Simulator at the University of Hull. So basically this is a big sandbox, four meters wide and, and, and six meters uh, long, and I applied different uh, uh, conditions in this, uh, in this experiment. Um, the experiment I'm showing here, um, uh, I will show this image, Im image on this video twice. Um, so there's uh, groundwater coming from below uh, at, at a certain pressure. Um, and you will see that the surface gets wet above this, uh, the source. It's right underneath here. You get, you get ponding of water. Um, and then you get small uh, little outbursts of, of, of water. Here's, here's one going on there. So it, here's one there. And further downstream, when there's enough uh, water collecting in the source area, it flows down and starts to form this, uh, uh, this, this channel. Um, also, I have some more videos uh, online, and they should run a bit smoother than uh, they're running now. So basically, what I use these experiments for is, is there's a lot of uh, things happening on the surface here. There's these, 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 these source pits, there's these, these lobes forming here, and, and, uh, and, and the channels that, that start to form. And I use that to, to interpret uh, these systems on, uh, on Mars. So let me show an, uh, another experiment. This one is a bit more extreme. Um, in this experiment, I have a really high groundwater pressure. And what's happening here, the groundwater is able to lift the surface up, starting to make a, a subsurface lake, so to say which starts to expand, uh, crack the surface, and then all of a sudden there's a short outburst of, of, of groundwater. And this is one of the, the processes that, that groundwater is able uh, to do, uh, but we haven't uh, thought of this before because it, it never happened on Earth. And in, in an experiment like this, uh, it's a good starting point to, uh, well, to, to investigate that further. Uh, so here's a short summary of, the, of a series of experiments uh, I did. On the, uh, the middle and the right image are the experiments I just showed. And the main message uh, uh, here is that if you have a different groundwater pressure, uh, you can different outflow processes, which can be much more efficient and much more extreme than we, we, we previously uh, thought of. Um, so now back to Mars. Um, I use these experimental insight uh, to interpret uh, 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 several areas uh, on, on Mars. Um, and as a result, I, I, I found that there, there's many small but also large uh, systems that, that have all of these features uh, that you can also see in these, uh, in these experiments. And it all relates to, um, uh, to, to, to a groundwater system. Um, and a few of the impl implications um, uh, I, I want to point out is um, these outflows of, of water are, are, are driven by uh, subsurface processes. So there's this, this groundwater and there's also a, a tectonics that, that triggers these outflows. So it has nothing to do with the conditions that are uh, at the surface. So in order to get these uh, uh, huge outflows of water, you don't need a warm or a, or a, or a, wet, uh, or a wet climate, which is quite typical for uh, well, a large part of, of the, the, the history of Mars. So just to summarize, uh, a few of the most uh, uh, important and, and novel results um, is first of all that, uh, uh, in contrary to what, what we previously thought, is that groundwater can result in very extreme floods, um, just with different processes than, uh, uh, than, than well, that, what, 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 what groundwater usually does. Uh, and as a result, you have these um, very uh, short but extreme uh, events in, in otherwise very climb, uh, climb periods, uh, dry, dry periods. There's many evidence for such uh, systems on Mars, both small and, and, and very large. Uh, and the, the uh, main implication is, is that you don't need a warm or uh, a wet period for these uh, cases. Um, and if you're interested in more of this, um, uh, here's two of my recent publications that are also on the, on the website again. I'll show it again, media.egu.eu slash documents. Um, 
also I put a summary of my uh, PhD thesis there, and for the Dutch press, I also have a Dutch summary. Uh, and if you want to see the entire thesis, uh, uh, let me know. There's plenty of images in there, and I've published it under a Creative Commons license. So if you like to use that, uh, be my guest. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your interesting talks. We'll now open the floor for questions. Does anyone have any questions? I think there are. Oh, Hi, my name is Karl Urban. I'm a freelancer for the Deutschlandfunk in German, public radio. Um, one question for Svetlana and Jelling. Um, those features you observed with uh, satellite imagery, for me it looks always, always a bit difficult to, to, um, to look at these images and then tell about um, water processes. So, so how can you sort out that there was water involved and those processes or these features you saw, uh, saw uh, are not made by, by non-water processes on the surface? Well, and you are right. It's really kind of hard. There are always some dilemmas, and we are. It's uh, our results are fresh out of the oven, so we need to work more on these. But that's why I decided just to offer you one piece of evidence where we are pretty confident that these are cyclic steps related to water. And as I try to explain, uh, what is important for us is to understand the physics. And the physics here is that uh, deltas are systems. First of all, those deltas that we are looking we are looking on for the features on these deltas deltas are something that has been documented that uh, there is a work that is published on these deltas so they are definitely fluvial deltas now we are looking for features on these fluvial deltas so we know that they are created by water possibly uh, there is ongoing aeolian surface aeolian processes that are actually modifying a lot of features that are on mars but it's very unlikely that they are uh, exactly where we expected to find them, and also they are kind of uh, um, features that are that have those uh, uh, transverse ridges, which is signature of uh, 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 hydraulic jumps that I also pointed out. At um, then they are net depositional, as uh, net erosional, as opposed to net depositional. So if you had seen uh, uh, surface ridges, there are something that's called uh, surface uh, uh, tr transverse e transverse aeolian ridges. Okay. They are created by aeolian processes. They look quite different from uh, uh, transverse ridges associated with cyclic steps. So we are pretty confident that these are uh, uh, cyclic steps associated with not only with water but with the uh, 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 submarine environment. Okay. I can maybe comment a little bit because now I showed you, of course, some images, but we do also some use some other techniques. For example, the slopes and fluvial flows, debris flows, and dry flows. They have very different slopes on Earth. And also on Mars, this will be uh, similar because we also see some signatures of places where there was no liquid water. And then the gully fans look very different. They're much steeper. And we have also stereo images of these satellites. So we can make elevation models, which are pretty... Th th at least the accuracy is much, more, much better than we need. So we can measure the slopes. And then we indeed see that these dry stuff, they're near the angle of repose. And then if you have some water involved, you get much lower slopes because it flows much better. So, of course, we combine also some different types of information. Thank you. Are there any additional questions from here in the room? Michael Jensen, uh, freelance in Austria. I have a question to the two men on the panel. Um, as I understand, the processes you're talking about are very recently. So, um, how do you account for the water staying liquid? Because in the pressure that we now experience on Mars, water would quickly boil away. So is, are these processes relatively quickly developing or how does the water stay liquid? Can I uh, start first? So the features I'm, uh, 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 I study are not very recent. Uh, they, they were formed in the... Um, uh, I put the image up here again in the... Uh, most of them are formed in the Hesperian period, so that's three and a half uh, billion years ago. Um, but still, in that period, the atmospheric pressure was probably already quite low, which doesn't allow uh, liquid water to, 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 well, to be present at the surface for, for a long period of time. But that's why groundwater is such an important uh, factor here, because if you go deeper into the ground, the pressure increases, so you can have a stable reservoir of liquid water there. 
and when it's come to the surface, uh, it can still be there for a few days or a few weeks, and then it will uh, quickly disappear. Uh, but that's quite a uh, well, useful source of, of liquid water in these uh, conditions. All right, yeah, so my processes are really recent, maybe to use Wouter's uh, timeline, then you would be something really here. But still, nowadays indeed, you cannot have really liquid water because the atmospheric pressure is too low. But on Mars, if we understand the current understanding of the climate, is that the obliquity of Mars, that's um, if you have the sun and you have Mars, and then it's, it's, it's like this a little bit. And on Earth, this obliquity, it varies with two to three degrees. And on Earth, it already causes ice ages and warm ages. And on Mars, it goes with 20 to 30 degrees. So you have a very large effect, and you have this very large polar caps also on Mars. So if you're, if you're oriented like this, you have a lot of insulation at the polar caps. They will start to sublimate. This, this will increase the atmospheric density, and therefore you get some, some snowfall also in the mid-latitudes of the planet. And also in some locations you can have, for very short periods I guess, you can have melting of water and liquid water. And also debris flows are very episodic events, so you only need a little bit of uh, liquid water to get a debris flow. And because Mars is really cold and frozen, you have a permafrost layer, so you have a frozen ground. And only the top part of the frozen ground can, uh, can melt during uh, war warm periods. So if you have some melt water, it will infiltrate, but it will stop at half a meter or something because it's frozen. Because, so you will saturate this upper layer really, really fast. And then also you have a sliding plane at this frozen top layer, and that's how you can get the reflow. So you need just the right conditions and these obliquity excursions, and then you can have uh, episodic events with liquid water. Hi, this is a question from the chat um, for Dr. Kostik from Leo Enright from Irish TV. Um, what's to say that the cyclic steps you see aren't aeolian, like in the NPLDs? Say that again. I didn't. Oh, sorry. He actually now says. For, um, he now says first question answered, and now it's for Charling. But I can repeat your question just to sure. make sure that has been answered. Uh -huh. What's to say that the cyclic steps you see are aren't aeolian? But yes, I think yeah. you. You yeah. reply to that. Yeah. Do you want I to thought, add anything? Well, and there is a really nice slide that I want to show you. Uh, if we can get back to my presentation, where there is really good example of how Aeolian uh, no. steps look. Uh, how uh, those are actually Aeolian dunes, but uh, Aeolian processes can uh, Aeolian processes actually produce uh, cyclic steps that are very different scale. They are associated with, as I said, catabatic winds. So uh, these are kind of mega huge of the order of, so let's go back all, all, all the way back to last, this slide. So if you look at the scale, they are of the, of the order of 25 to 50 kilometers. Mine are of the order of, or actually ours, of the order of maybe 200 to 300 meters. So th those are order of magnitudes. Um, also these are created in, in ice. So ours have nothing to do with ice. They are on actually, on, uh, as I said, you need water, and water is working on sediment. So that is uh, erodible sediment. So these are, uh, in terms of physics, there is a lot of similarity, but medium is different, and process that forms them is different, and scales are different. Just in terms of appearance, they are quite similar. Okay? So we do know that they have nothing to do with the organ. But just also I wanted to show you this slide. This is kind of very common feature that you see on Mars, those are Aeolian dunes, and they have been observed uh, on many places, among others, usually within craters, and that is image uh, obtained by uh, Opportunity Rover. So, and kind of confusing here is what I mentioned previously, those are those uh, transverse ridges, and they call them transverse Aeolian ridges, that's what I try to uh, to mention before. Uh, so that is part of a confusion there, that we have something that's called transverse ridges that is associated with the signature of hydraulic jumps in a uh, deep sea environment on Earth, and also something that can be formed by, uh, by um, a wind, and we know that wind is now modifying uh, nearly everything. But there is also one more f uh, very cool feature that I probably uh, didn't point out, uh, previously, that is uh, that uh, deep water sediments, they are actually settling 
and uh, that helps preserve the, our bed forms. So there is process, so-called consolidation process. So uh, we count also that process. There are two uh, major processes, hydraulic jumps, that stabilize each step within that train, so that preserves train as a whole, plus we count also on consolidation, so that helps. Thank you. And we have a second question also from Leo from Irish TV. And this one is for Charling. Can you explain again how you can be so sure a chaotic deposit is not a dry debris flow or even a chat rate driven event? Again, why, why it's not a dry debris flow? How can you be so sure that this deposit is not a dry debris flow or even a chat rate driven event? Well. A dry, dry flows, they have very, like I said, very different depositional slopes. And I also have a lot of DEMs of these systems, so I can measure. And then the slopes are way too low to get dry flows. Um, also, we, we compare to terrestrial analogs. And we, we know, for example, if we have dry flows on a terrestrial analog, analog, they're really steep. And also the sorting patterns and the sedimentology is different than compared to a debris flow. So those are the methods I used. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question, if there is one more question from here in the room. If not, we'll finish here. You're welcome to approach our speakers. And next up is a press conference at 12 on the latest results from the ESA Rosetta mission. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you all for your great talks. Thank you. Welcome.